وأشهد أن سيدنا ومولانا وعظيمنا وزعيمنا وحبيبنا محمدا صلى الله عليه وسلم اللهم أحينا على سنته وأمتنا على ملته واحشرنا تحت لوائه وأوردنا حوضه واسقنا من يده الشريفة شربة هنيئة لا نظمأ بعدها أبدا اللهم أمين We have been addressing the issue of Islam and public life and this series has been uh, developed in response and clarification of the issue of the relationship between Islam and politics and governance because the trends that have been growing in Muslim lands is to exclude the deen from public life similar to what happened in the West thinking that if we just remove the deen from public life then the society will be in peace at least one piece and everything will prosper everybody will focus on working developing the economy and all of that we know that the deen and Allah have been removed from public life for other nations but politics comes to be the dividing element which means people will continue to be divided no matter what no matter what the dividing line is so it is not the deen that divides people it is the nature of man وَلَوْ شَاءَ رَبُّكَ لَجَعَلَ النَّاسَ أُمَّةً وَاحِدَةً وَلَا يَزَالُونَ مُخْتَلِفِينَ إِلَّا مَنْ رَحِمَ رَبُّكَ Had Allah willed it, He would have made all people one ummah, one faith, one religion, one community, and still they would have differences. So religion is not the reason for differences. People are different because of other reasons. We are created as independent individual agents. You remember Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in Surah Maryam telling us, وَكُلُّكُمْ آتِيهِ يَوْمَ الْقِيَامَةِ فَرْدًا Every one of you will come as an individual. Why not as a group? Because your deeds are your only reason between you and paradise and between you and hellfire. Your fate is hinged only on your reason, not on your claimed belonging, being from that tribe or that family or that nation or that town doesn't have anything to do with your fate. Your fate is crafted by your own hands. And because we are created as independent individual agents, Allah gave us the faculties to use as individuals. So the way you think, vis-a-vis -vis the way your neighbor may think, is like two people sleeping in the same bed, but each one has their own dreams. Everyone has their own dreams. So being next to someone doesn't necessarily mean that you are tied with what he does, what he says, or what he thinks. You finally make up your mind. There is an element of rubbing on each other, but that is minor. The final decision maker is you and your neighbor independent from each other. So because Allah created us as individual persons and agents, each one is responsible individually. And to be individually independent, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gave us capacities that are similar but different. We all more or less have ears. We all more or less have eyes. We all more or less have hearts to think and ponder. But we do not use all of these in the same way. It is like all of us may have TV but we don't all watch the same channel. We don't all like one and the same show, right? So it is exactly the same. You have faculties, but you have the independent way to use your faculties your way. So the reason we are different is because we are created to be different. 
Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it as one of the signs, the greatest signs of creation. وَمِنْ آيَاتِهِ اِخْتِلَافُ أَلْسِنَتِكُمْ وَأَلْوَانِكُمْ One of the signs of the greatness of creation is that you are different both in your tongue and in your color. We speak different languages. We live in different cultures. We absorb and see and understand things differently. That's why we are different. Whether the dividing difference is the way we understand religion or lack thereof, the way we deal with politics or lack thereof, or the way we engage our environment, our world. But the bottom line is we are different because we are different. Allah created us to be individually responsible, so he made each individual of us his own man and his own woman and his own independent agent. Having said that, then one could easily conclude that whether we fight over money or we fight over politics or we fight over religion, we are bound to fight because we have our own motives, inside motives, that make us want to get things done our way. So much so that we, some of us at least, wish that this universe was structured and built and managed the way we want. I gave you the example maybe two weeks ago or three weeks ago about a person who was fighting against everything that Allah said we need to do. Discussing why wine is haram, why pork is haram, why this. And finally I had to tell him, listen man, next time you create uni your universe, you set your own rules. Because some of us are living with similar spirits but on limited basis. This person is a very striking example of how extreme we go when we think we have the absolute freedom. But Allah did not make us absolute free people. We are free, but not absolute. There are limits and ceilings to how far we can go. Uh, I used Surah Al-Fatih uh, last time to illustrate how Islam wants us to deal with our life and how Islam has, I'm sorry with this, I am not the expert on using these guys here. Come on. Huh? You hear it? He's doing it. Okay, thank you. Thank you. <coughs> so when we when we spoke two weeks ago about Surah Al Fatih and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala doesn't only take interest in telling us what to do, but he is taking interest in how we do it, and he's taking interest in giving us comfort as we do what he tells us what to do. And he takes interest in telling us what is going on around us and inside us and inside some of us. I don't know if I'm clear, but maybe when we read the ayat, it will make this clear. From the beginning, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Indeed, we have given you, O Muhammad, a clear conquest. This is the conquest of Mecca. The ayat of Surah Al-Fatih was revealed on the way, the trip back from Mecca to Medina after the Treaty of Hudaybiyah. We covered the Treaty of Hudaybiyah last time, so I'm not going to go over the same materials again. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the Prophet, and when the Prophet received this ayah and the surah, because it came all at once, the Prophet sallallahu said, there is nothing I have received from heaven as good and pleasing as what I receive today. He is coming from a treaty in which he caved in literally to conditions that were not fair, let alone favorable to Muslims. Despite the fact they could have fought 
But because they were going for Umrah, they decided not to go for uh, invading Mecca. So he decided to come back next year and to have a peace treaty for 10 years. 10 years of peace. And the Prophet ﷺ was told by Allah uh, in the inspiration that this is good. On his way back, after he has done everything, the Quran came down to tell him, Inna fatahna laka fathan mubina. Indeed, we have given you a great conquest. This is victory. This is not defeat. So that Allah may forgive for you what preceded of your sin and what will follow and complete his favor upon you and guide you to a straight path. Meaning that Allah is not only giving him victory, he's giving him forgiveness. And when you read the rest of the ayat, he will give forgiveness and acceptance not only to the Prophet, but to the companions that gave him the pledge of commitment to defend the deen with their life and never to flee away if they had to confront the disbelievers who blocked them from getting into Mecca. And that Allah may aid you with a mighty victory. That you will have definitely. And the Prophet came back to Mecca two years after the Treaty of Hudaybiyyah and he came back victorious but humble. He came back when he came the first time in the year of Hudaybiyyah, he came with 1400 people. That's all what he had. And he left behind in Medina hypocrites and the Jewish community hoping and uh, insisting that he will never come back. Not he, not his companions, as the ayat explained to us. But Allah brought him back, and when he came back to Mecca, they were not only 1,400, they were 10,000. 10,000 people coming with the Prophet and he went from Medina to Mecca publicly. So he announced that he's coming to Mecca knowing the fact that three years before, four years before, the people of Mecca rallied all of the pagan tribes and came all the way to Medina and they seized around the Medina trying to obliterate the Muslim community. So knowing the enemies he may face, but he trusted the promise of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. You will be given a mighty victory. Trusting Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And Allah tells him, it is he who sent down tranquility, comfort, and contentment into the hearts of the believers that they would increase, be increased in faith along with their current faith level. And to Allah belongs the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah knowing and wise. Allah has control over everything. So what you get from Allah when you obey Allah is not only orders, but you get comfort, you get support to yourself and to those around you. So what else does anybody need? If you are in a fight and you have Allah on your side, what else do you need? You need nothing. So Allah does not only send commands, he also could send angels. He could send his direct support to you. He could send peace, contentment, and tranquility on your heart so that you are not shaken, you're not afraid. And this is very important for anybody in a conflict like the one the Muslims were in at that time. لِيُدْخِلَ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ وَالْمُؤْمِنَاتِ So that Allah may admit the believing men and women to gardens beneath which rivers flow, to abide therein eternally, and remove from them their misdeeds, so that Allah would enter the believers, men and women, into heavens, and to remove their sinful deeds, to forgive them, and to expiate their sins. And ever is that 
in the sight of Allah a great attainment. What a great win that you are both victorious, you are not shaken, your sins are forgiven, your heart is supported by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, your feet is firm by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and you end up having all of your sins forgiven as you enter into paradise. So the Quran is not just a book of do's and don'ts. There is much more to it than that. But it all depends on whether you do what you're asked to do or not. On the other side, those who wish the Prophet and the companions never come back, the hypocrites and the pagans, men and women, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is going to punish them. So Allah does not only deal with you as a Muslim, as you are engaged in defense of your faith, in defense of your community, he is also having his own way of dealing with the other side. Those who wish you obliterated and uh, demolished. And that Allah may punish the hypocrite men and hypocrite women, and the polytheist men and women, those who assume about Allah an assumption of evil nature. What is the assumption? They told the Prophet ﷺ when he was signing the Treaty of Hudaybiyah, you think that those poor, illiterate, ignorant guys are going to stand with you? They would leave you alone. And Abu Bakr lambasted them for this. Even though whatever is narrated on his behalf is not a language we could attribute to Abu Bakr, the most polite person, but he lambasted them in his answer telling them, what do you think of yourself? You think we are going to let him down? Now the hypocrites are not only saying, that's what the, the pagans were saying, the mushriks, but the hypocrites were saying that Allah would let them down. They will not be victorious, they will not be entering Mecca, and they will never get back to Mecca again, and even if they fight, they will never come back again. That the mushriks will finish them off. This is what is uh, regarded here as negative evil assumption about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Upon them is misfortune of evil nature and Allah has become angry with them or sent his wrath and curse upon them and prepared for them hell and evil it is as a destination. What an evil destination to be in hellfire. May Allah protect us all from hellfire. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not watching a game between two teams. As you see, he's fully engaged and he is giving the news to the Muslims that as you go back, this is gonna happen and you will have me taking your back and you will have me taking down your enemies with my wrath, my curse and my anger. And to Allah belong the soldiers of the heavens and the earth, and ever is Allah exalted and might and wise. Allah has control over everything. So if you follow Allah, His soldiers are yours. They are yours, but He controls everyone. He does not put them under your control. He controls His soldiers, and He sends them wherever He sees fit but they are at your service. They are at your service. Indeed, we have sent you, O Muhammad, as a witness and a giver of glad tidings and a warner. These are some of the functions of the Prophet ﷺ, to give good news for people who believe and follow through, and to warn those who are not following, are not believing, and are not obedient, and to be a witness over all. Why? So that you people may believe in Allah and his messenger and honor him and respect the prophet and exalt Allah morning and afternoon. This is the life of the Muslim. The life of the Muslim is to always open his ears and heart to whatever comes from Allah, whatever comes from the messenger, and to do exactly that, nothing less 
nothing more. Just do what Allah tells you to do. Then you become in the protection of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Then as the Prophet وسلم, had taken the pledge of commitment from his companions, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling them his appreciation as his and his reaction to the pledge of commitment that they have given to the Prophet Indeed, those who pledge allegiance to you, O Muhammad, they are actually pledging allegiance to Allah. The hand of Allah is over their hands. So he who breaks his word only breaks it to the detriment of himself. And he who fulfills that which he has promised, Allah will give him a great reward. Very interactive, very engaging. Allah is not far. He is with you as he always promises. وَقَالَ اللَّهُ إِنِّي مَعَكُمْ لَإِنْ أَقَمْتُمُ الصَّلَاةَ وَآتَيْتُمُ الزَّكَاةَ وَآمَنْتُمْ بِرُسُلِي وَعَزَّرْتُمُوهُمْ Then I will give you all my support. If you believe and if you do righteous deeds, if you support my prophets and messengers and follow through with them, you will be given the same support. Those who remain behind of the Bedouins will say to you, oh, proper, uh, our properties and our families occupied us. Now the hypocrites in Medina, as they are receiving the Prophet Sallallahu and the believers coming back from Mecca after the Hudaybiyah Treaty, they are preparing their excuses. We were too busy, our families, our houses, we're going to be exposed. We have business as if they are the only ones who have families and business and exposure. Our properties and our families occupied us, so ask forgiveness for us. They want the Prophet in person to ask Allah to forgive them. So if they really believed that he was a Prophet, why don't they join him? Why don't they join him? If they believe his dua to Allah is going to be answered, why don't they join him? Because they are actually not believers. They pretend. And this is an issue we need to understand. Hypocrites of every time who want to take the middle ground between truth and falsehood, they actually belong to falsehood. They have nothing to do with truth but pretension. They pretend to believe. If they meet with the believers, they say, we believe, we are with you. Don't we tell you this? Didn't we stand with you? Haven't we supported you? And if the believers had a bad day, like the day of Uhud, the hypocrites would say, well, haven't we warned you? Haven't we told you? that these guys are formidable, you're not up to them, you didn't believe us. And they go to the disbelievers and tell them, haven't we given you the secrets of the believers? Haven't we given you information? Which they did. They want to break the ranks of the believers. This is the function of hypocrites. They work against you, but when they meet you, they look you in the eye and they say, we are with you. We are with truth. But Allah is telling us and them, He knows everything. He hears their private discussions. Wallahu ya'lamu sirrakum wa najwakum. Allah knows your public discussion and your private communication. Then who could prevent Allah at all? They say with their tongue that which is not within their hearts. They say, then who could prevent Allah, say, O Muhammad, who could prevent Allah at all if he intended for you harm or intended for you benefit? Rather, ever is Allah with what you do very well acquainted. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows your secret and your public and your private, not only discussions, but even thoughts. Even before it becomes a real thought, Allah knows it when it is an idea in your heart. Before you formalize it, He knows. Wallahu alimun bidat al-sudur. 
when a hypocrite comes and talks to the Muslim community and says, I am with you, your enemies are doing this and this and this, in deceit, trying to convince you that he is part of you, he and Allah know well that he is lying. They know that he is lying. But you thought that the messenger and the believers would never return to their families. You thought that their families will be your booties, your spoils, after they get defeated in Mecca. That's what they thought and they wished. Ever and that was made pleasing in your heart. That was the comforting thought you have for not going out. So when the companions and the Prophet ﷺ were leaving Medina to go to Mecca uh, for Umrah in the, in the year of Hudaybiyah, the disbelievers, the mushriks and the pagans, they thought they would never come back again. Who could have uncovered those kinds of thoughts but Allah? And now they are being given clearly, not only to the Prophet privately, but to the believers. This Quran was recited as the caravan was going back from Mecca to Medina. And you assumed an assumption of evil and became a people ruined. You ruined yourself by taking that position. And until today, we have people who do not join any effort to defend even themselves, fearing that if Muslims get defeated, the enemies of Muslims will have the day and we will lose everything. So they would rather stay behind, they would rather hide and play hypocrites. But among those hypocrites are one who are active hypocrites, who are going all the way with the enemy to give them the secrets of your community, the secrets of your society, the secrets of your nation when it is fighting against another nation. Because they feel that the balance is tipping the other way. So they think that Muslims are stupid. They think that Muslims are stupid because they are weak. And this is explained in Surah Al-Anfal. And you thought that Muslims, Muslims would never have the day for themselves, which means they will never be victorious. The same thing that is mentioned here. And whoever has not believed in Allah and his messenger, then indeed we have prepared for the disbeliever a blaze. This is the warning side of the function of the Prophet. Allah wants him to tell them what is awaiting them on the other side. When we all leave this, where everybody is going to go. And to Allah belongs the dominion of the heavens and the earth. He forgives whom he wills and punishes whom he wills. And ever is Allah forgiving and merciful. Those two qualities work hand in hand. Some of us Muslims, unfortunately, would love to emphasize the fact that Allah is merciful and He is. But this emphasis should not remove the fact that He also punishes, that He also has the power to punish and reward evil deeds as they deserve. Those who remain behind will say, when you set out toward the war booty to take it, let us follow you. They wish to change the words. When the Prophet ﷺ came, only one Jewish tribe remained behind that stood to support the pagans of Mecca when they attacked Medina. And the Prophet ﷺ determined that they must go out because they are working as a fifth column in the community of Medina and they were in violation, in violation of the uh, constitution or covenant of Medina, which we can explain some other time. So in their violation, they stood with the disbelievers against their commitment to be a community of Medina in which 
their religion is protected, their positions are protected, their businesses are protected, their families are protected by the Muslims. Those who remain behind will say, when you set out towards the war booty to take it, let us follow you. They wish to change the words of Allah. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala told the prophets, never have them join you in any war anymore. Don't rely on them for anything. Get them out of your consideration. Never will you follow us. Say, O Muhammad, you will never follow us. Thus did Allah say before. So they will say, rather, you envy us. See, they always have to corner the believers. You are the evil guys, not them. You want evil for them because you are envious. But in fact, they were not understanding except a little. They don't understand or they don't want to understand that it is their evil doing that resulted in their exclusion. They want to get the war spoils without being in the war. It's just nonsense. They want the, the gains, but they don't want any pain. They don't want to risk anything. They said our family could be exposed. Our business could be lost. But then they want their business and family and money and themselves and their blood protected. And they want the booties and the spoils too. <clears throat> Say, O Muhammad, to those who remain behind of the Bedouins, you will be called to face a people of great military might. You may fight them or they will submit. So if you obey, Allah will give you a good reward. But if you turn away, as you turned away before, he will punish you with a painful punishment. That's fair. They are put to another test. They will be put, given another chance. But don't ask for the bodies in a war you didn't fight. It's not fair. But definitely, they are going to fail the second time as they failed the first time. Then the Quran lays down the categories of people who are excused in real, not false excuses. There is not upon the blind any guilt or upon the lame any guilt or upon the ill for staying behind. And whoever obeys Allah and his messenger, he will admit him to gardens beneath which rivers flow. But whoever turns away, he will punish him, Allah will punish him with a painful punishment. So the dividing line between the believers, as it shows here in the ayah, and the hypocrites is who listens to Allah and follow through with their commitment and who breaks their commitment with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Very important, very important. Then the Prophet sallallahu as he took the covenant and the pledge from the people to fight with him, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving them the reward. Certainly Allah was pleased with the believers who gave you the pledge of allegiance, O Muhammad, under the tree. And he knew what was in their hearts. He knew that they were sincere and they were committed and they were going to follow through. So he sent down tranquility upon them and rewarded them with an imminent conquest. See, when your heart is firmly with Allah, you gain in this life and in the hereafter. When your heart is shaken, you may gain in the hereafter, but definitely you're not gonna gain anything here. Because when your heart is shaken, your enemies have the edge. You don't have the courage, your enemies have the edge. And much war booty and spoils which they will take, and ever is Allah exalted in might and wise. They will not only have victory, they will have war spoils and things to gain. Allah has promised you much booty and spoils that you will take in the future and has hastened for you this victory and withheld the hands of the people from you and that it may be a sign for the believers and that he may guide you to a straight path. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when he directed the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa to sign the treaty of Hudaybiyah, 
which was not fair, as we mentioned, to the Muslims. It was to protect them from bloodshed that was imminent. And he gave them in return for their patience and their obedience and their commitment to Allah and to the Messenger, a promise of an imminent victory, which came no more than two years after. And he promised other victories that you were so far unable to realize, which Allah has already encompassed. And ever is Allah over all things competent. Allah can do and will do anything he wants to do. And if those Meccans, the pagans of Mecca, who disbelieve had fought you, they would have turned their backs in fight, in flight. They would have fled. And this is very important because the rumors in Medina is that if, if the pagans of Mecca were to fight the Prophet in the trip of Umrah in Hudaybiyah, they would obliterate the Muslims. Allah saying no. Amazing statement. No. The disbelievers would have fled, not the Muslims. Then they would not find a protector or a helper. This is the established law and sunnah and way of Allah, which has occurred before. And never will you find in the way of Allah any change. This is a fixed rule by Allah that when the believers meet the disbelievers and the believers, no matter how few they may be, but they are standing on grounds of truth and justice in defense of their faith and defense of their nation and defense of their community and women and children and money, they never flee, their enemies flee away. They never get defeated. This is a sunnah that the ayah is referring to. And it is he who has withheld their hands from you and your hands from them within the area of Mecca, the outskirts of Mecca where Hudaybiyah is, after he caused you to overcome them. And ever is Allah of what you do seeing. When they came to Mecca, the year of the conquest, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala made it a peaceful entry. No bloodshed. How did this happen? Muslims came 10,000 people. Yes, they had their swords, but just to stand in defense of themselves in case they are attacked because of what happened before. But they would rather get in peacefully. So Allah, in his might and control, threw fear in the hearts of the disbelievers, and they stood down. They did not stand to fight. And Allah is describing what happened. Some Muslims, as the Muslims were entering into Mecca, they spoke language of revenge. One of them started shouting, Al yawmu yawmu al Today is the day of butchering and bloodshed. And the Prophet ﷺ answered before anybody chants back to, the, to this person. And he said, Al yawmu yawmu al Today is a day of mercy. And he set people free. He said, he who gets to his home, he is protected, he is safe. He who gets to the holy uh, mosque in Mecca, he is safe. And to give honor to one of the leaders of the Meccans who stood against him then was not a Muslim, Abu Sufyan, he said, he who gets to Abu Sufyan's place, he is also safe to give him some recognition as a big man in his community and also to attract whatever is left of reason and logic in his mind to reconsider his position, which he did later. So when, when you see the, 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 the scene of Muslims coming to Mecca and it's a peaceful march and the Prophet ﷺ is bowing his head in humility to Allah, that he is bringing him back to the place from which he was driven 10 years ago. He was kicked out, helpless, weak, and unable to defend even himself, let alone any of his companions, now that he comes 
in this great victory, seeing that the ayat he recited on his way back to Medina are coming to be fulfilled. A prophecy is being manifested in real life, in real time, in everybody's life. So he was so humbled that he would bow down his head as he was entering into Mecca. Then Allah tells the real story so that history is not made up by those who write it later on. Because after every confrontation between any two fighting people, there is always revisionist historians to tell you what actually happened. So Allah wants to put the real account for everybody to hear. They are the ones who disbelieved and obstructed you from the Masjid al-Haram while the offering was prevented from reaching its place of sacrifice. And if not for believing men and believing women whom you didn't know, that you might trample them and there would befall you because of them dishonor. Without your knowledge, you would have been permitted to enter Mecca. They stood and prevented you a couple of years ago. And if you were to enter by force, then you would have trampled over Muslims who have embraced Islam but could not migrate. They were living among the pagan community of Mecca. They couldn't move out. And you, Muhammad, and your companions would have killed some of them or shed some of their blood in the chaos of confrontation. And then your people in Mecca would have dishonored you, but Allah stopped you from doing it. So not getting into Mecca, Allah wants to say, it is a divine command. It is not a military tactic. It is not anything. Allah wanted it to happen this way, to protect these people and to protect the honor and the dignity of the Prophet When those who disbelieved had put into their hearts chauvinism, the chauvinism of the time of ignorance, but Allah sent down his tranquility upon his messenger and upon the believers and imposed upon them the word of righteousness. And they were more deserving of it and worthy of it. And ever is Allah of all things knowing. Out of his knowledge and wisdom, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given the Sahaba the tranquility of following through with the Prophet despite the fact they dis I'm sorry, they disagreed with the agreement. They disagreed with the agreement, but they lived up to it. When Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail ibn Amr, the pagan leader negotiating the treaty with the Prophet وسلم, and signing on behalf of the disbelievers, when his son came as a Muslim, the Prophet وسلم, told the companions, we cannot take him. We just signed an agreement. The ink is not dry yet. I am not allowed to renege on a signature. I can't. We have to live up to it. And he told Abu Jandal, the son of Suhail ibn Amr, Allah will give you and people like you a way out. And Allah did. But this is not the time to tell how. And they were more deserving of it and worthy of it. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants to recount his uh, bounty and blessings upon the Prophet and the companions. So he said, certainly Allah has showed to his messenger the vision. In truth, you will surely enter the Masjid al-Haram if Allah wills in safety. Look at this. This is the vision that the Prophet وسلم, saw before the conquest of Mecca. You will enter and you will enter it safe. This is a mighty promise. It cannot come but from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. How could the Prophet make it up? He knew that less than a year ago or two years, he was about to enter into a military clash. So how could he say, I'm going to enter Mecca, me and my companions, safe, without war, in peace? Uh, with your heads shaved and hair shortened, not fearing anyone. He knew what you didn't know and has arranged before that a conquest 
near at hand, very close. It is he who has sent his messenger with guidance and the religion of truth. This is now the conclusion. This is the one ayah before last in the surah that gives us the conclusion, these two ayahs. Allah sent the messenger with guidance, guidance and the deen of truth, meaning this is what you need to consider. That is what's most important. And the ultimate purpose is to let it prevail over all other belief systems. Allah made Islam prevail over all other belief systems. To manifest it over all religions, and sufficient is Allah as a witness, then at the end, Muhammadun Rasulullah. This is not, this is not anyone in the community. He is a messenger, which means he is chosen, which means he is supported, which means he is the epic example of submission. Follow him. Muhammadun Rasulullah. وَالَّذِينَ مَعَهُ And those who are with him, the believers. أَشِدَّاءُ عَلَى الْكُفَّارِ رُحَمَاءُ بَيْنَهُمْ They are uh, strong and powerful against the disbelievers. And they are merciful among themselves. You see them bowing down and in prostration, seeking the bounties of Allah and his acceptance and his pleasure. Their signs of piety and righteousness radiates from their faces, from their bowing down and prostration on the floor. And this is their example in the Torah. While their example in the gospel is like a plant that branched out, and this branch became stronger and stronger, and it came straight up, and it became the envy of all farmers, so that they are, they are the source of annoyment to the disbelievers. What is the Quran talking about? The Quran is talking about the companions, the fruits of the mission and the work of the Prophet and the support of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah has promised those who believed and did righteous deed among them, forgiveness and a great reward. This is what we learn that Allah did not send this religion for private practice in the darkness of your bedroom or living room. It is meant to be with you wherever you are and the guidance is so broad to help you in every situation in your life. So anyone who wants to treat Islam like any other religion that is confined to the heart of the person or to their nicety of their character or their spirituality in their personal life, they don't understand Islam. May Allah guide us to understand Islam. الحمد لله وكفى والصلاة والسلام على عباده الذين اصطفى وأشهد أن لا إله إلا الله وحده لا شريك له وأشهد أن سيدنا ولانا محمد عبد ورسول وبعد Brothers and sisters, as we, the Muslim Ummah, are going through a lot of challenges these days, we need this guidance the most to understand ourselves, to understand our choices, and to help us craft our way forward towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allahumma hadina fi man hadayt, wa aafina fi man aafayt, wa tawallana fi man tawallayt, wa qina wa sarif anna sharra ma qadayt. Allahumma qsim lana min khashiyatika ma tahulu bi baynana wa bayna maasiyatik, wa min taatika ma tubalighuna bihi jannatak, wa min al yaqeen ma tuhawunu bi alayna masaib al-dunya, wa matti'na Allahumma bi asma'ina, وأبصارنا وقوتنا ما أحييتنا واجعله الوارث منا واجعل ثأرنا على من ظلمنا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل مصيبتنا في ديننا ولا تجعل الدنيا أكبر همنا ولا مبلغ علمنا ولا إلى النار مصيرنا 
وإذا أردت بقومنا فتنة فنجنا منها يا مولانا غير خزايا ولا مفتونين ولا مبدلين ولا مغيرين اللهم انصر الإسلام وأعز المسلمين وأعلي بفضلك يا رب كلمة الحق والدين اللهم من أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بخير فوفقه لكل خير ومن أراد الإسلام والمسلمين بشر فاجعل كيده في نحره واجعل تدميره في تدبيره وخذه كما أخذت عادا وثمودا اللهم ول أمورنا خيارنا ولا تول أمورنا شرارنا اللهم اختم لنا بخاتمة السعادة أجمعين مع النبيين والصديقين والشهداء والصالحين أقول قولي هذا وأستغفر الله لي ولكم فستذكرون ما أقول لكم وأفوض أمري إلى الله إن الله بصير بالعباد وأقم الصلاة